It's go time. Home is not where you want to be, at least in 2023. Welcome everyone to Third Down Gamble, Don Charbon along with Heath Graham. We've got a four-game winning streak running for road teams. But before we get to that, let's give it a little push and see what happened after the Ticats and the Alouettes finished playing. Announced today, Hamilton's Chris Edwards received the maximum fine under the CFL CFL agreement for his post-game shove. I was a bit surprised that there was not at least a one-game suspension in conjunction with this today. The game was over. It was a pretty aggressive maneuver. I was I would have been expecting a one game. Anything beyond that would be unnecessary. But a fine doesn't seem to cut what these actions were. And Chris Edwards certainly isn't a first time offender in the CFL with some of these shenanigans. He has had fines or suspensions on a couple of other occasions as well. So for those who are not aware. After the final snap in Hamilton, Austin Mack, receiver for the Alouettes, who had a pretty big night, two touchdowns, goes to shake the hand of someone. We don't see them on screen initially. And then you see Chris Edwards come forward with a two-hander and sends Mack backwards. Now, Mack, to his credit, stays out of it. Things don't really escalate. As you mentioned, Chris Edwards famously got into it after an Eastern final in Toronto when he was with the Argonauts after the Argonauts had lost the Eastern final to the Tiger Cats. At that time, it was Tiger Cat fans. The issue with Chris Edwards, and this is something that was joked about on the Turf District, our uh, good friends there in Edmonton, is that he's always worth 15, and that 15 is a major foul per game. He's a great player, but he does take penalties that hurt the team and it's that control of temper you've got to have your emotions charged your emotions riding high but you need to know where the line is and how to pull yourself back what were your thoughts on the penalty that was dished out by the league i was surprised it was only the max fine i would have thought too that given priors or history if you want to call it that that he would have been suspended for at least a week. The probable outcome of this for the CFL dealing with this is that by doing the max fine, the CFLPA probably won't fight this, or nor will the Tiger Cats. They'll probably just leave it as is. It's a half a game check. It's, it's going to hurt. But I would agree with you. A game suspension was probably in the offing. We knew going into this season, there are some personalities on the Hamilton Tiger Cats team that Orlando Steinhauer was going to have a challenge to keep in check. We've seen Simone Lawrence in the past has been fined, suspended. Dakeel Williams has been fined and suspended. Chris Edwards has been fined and suspended. So there's there's three characters on that Tiger Cats team that can present some disciplinary challenges. The big thing that I will be watching is how Coach Steinhauer and the organization handle this is this giving a green light for those other guys to start acting out or will it be handled enough that they lay down the law and we won't see any further incidents? It's it's a long way to go in this season with those three guys in the locker room. The Tiger Cats are on a three-game losing skid to start the season. This is something that was not anticipated. Is this a, an indication of how frustrated the team is right now? Typically when teams get frustrated on the field, take stupid penalties at the end of game. That's a sign that they're angry that they're losing. Now, it's kind of a a waste to do it that way. The point of the game is to do something about it while the 60 minutes are underway. If you can't do it then, what's the point of hitting somebody after the game? These things happen. We're, they're human, as are we. These types of emotions run high. Some people can check it. Some people need to do a better job of it. Hamilton right now is on that precipice. What happens? You've got some very, very strong-willed characters on that team, not to mention their 
quarterback that isn't even playing right now that's on the sixth game, Bo Levi Mitchell, who has had a reputation of calling out players when they're not up to par in terms of what he thinks they are required to do. If there is that friction going on, it's just going to escalate with every loss. The Elks continue that home losing streak. It's 19 games. But interestingly, Kai Loxley is gone. And it almost felt like before I made it to the bus, he was already off the team. Reports are that he was called upon to go back in in a short yardage situation and refused to go in, which ultimately led to his release. We're not in that locker room. We don't know everything that went on, but it sure looked like at some point there was some conflict between Kai Loxley and Chris Jones. Loxley separated himself on the sideline from the rest of the team for about the last 10 minutes, kind of standing way to the side apart from the rest of the players and coaching staff. So did he quit on the team? Did the team quit on him? Was it compounding frustration, as you say, in in starting the season without a win? That home losing streak continues as well. I'm a bit surprised by this move, considering the struggles at quarterback that the Elks have had so far this season. But you can't be that that cancer in the in the locker room, and then and then turn over the ball on your one play in the game and expect to stick around. I think the biggest thing that hurt Loxley in a way, and it's tough to say this, but he desperately wanted to be a quarterback, and the Elks had started him at receiver. He got to go on third down gambles and he wasn't seeing the field as a quarterback the way I think he projected himself to be and when your hopes are being shattered that you're not going to be the starter you kind of wonder where you're going to fit in this whole organization anyway and certainly the frustration of fumbling the football I'm sure he was mad at himself over that and if the Elks were 2-0 and going into this game and looking at another win it might have been a different situation Winning does change a lot of things and you've got players on successful teams that aren't necessarily in the role that they would have anticipated being in, but stick around because of the culture, because of that winning attitude. And a player that jumps to mind for me is Johnny Augustine with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He's now in his fourth season with the Bombers, a talented running back in his own right, but hasn't had the opportunity to be the number one guy. He's out there on special teams every kick, busting downfield to make tackles. He has bought into that program and that culture. I'm sure he has ambition to be a starting running back and a feature back in this league, but doing the things on a team to get the wins is a lot different than being asked to do things on a team that hasn't won a home game in quite some time. It leads to other questions, I guess, when it comes to the teams that are oh and starting the season. Who's under pressure now the most? Is it Jones in Edmonton because of the pedigree that he came in with and the expectations that followed? Is it, heaven forbid, Orlando Steinauer in Hamilton, who has gone to two Grey Cups with the team? Is he possibly under some pressure here? There's a lot of questions. Bob Dice, we know, is going to get some slack because he's trying to build a team, so he'll get some opportunities to do that. But that's another O and team. It it really does make you wonder how how is the uh, temperature? Uh, Victor Kui has come out time and time again in favor of Chris Jones. If they wanted to get rid of him, he's on a series of one-year contracts. It was designed so that if he wanted to leave, he could. And if the team needed him gone, they could. So it was a very equitable way of doing things. That's a a situation that I I don't think is going to change much this year. I think Jones has a ton of allowance yet. But Orlando Steinhauer, I think there's enough allowance in that management group, especially going up to Bob Young, that will give him a ton of slack to get this sorted out. Remember last year that Hamilton started stumbling and bumbling and then came on at the end. Well, and it certainly doesn't help that their marquee quarterback is on the six-game injured list at the moment. There was a lot of high hopes for him, 
and he didn't even really get a chance to fully engage with the team before he ended up going down with a, a lengthy injury. It makes it tough when you've invested so heavily in someone and they're not there for you. Just ask the Ottawa Red Blacks and Jeremiah Mazzoli about that. Again, Mazzoli is not going to start. And there is starting to be some speculation as to when and if. And that's a tough one for the Red Blacks to take because they had a lot of faith that Mazzoli would be their guy at quarterback. And he has not set foot since that incident in Regina with Garrett Marino. Tia San ratings are coming on stronger and stronger. The overall ratings for the last weekend improved again, and it's a th- basically every week they're getting better and better. And I think part of it as we move forward is that people are getting now more in tune to the idea that the CFL is underway and there are... I, I've really liked this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday marquee matchup type of idea that they've come up with. Every time the riders are on the tube, they give a bump, but the Alouettes winning has really raised RDS's numbers as well. The one criticism I have heard regarding the Sunday games is a lot of people that attend the games in person would prefer if they were a bit earlier start. It does lead to a long night, especially somewhere like Saskatchewan, where you have fans driving in from all over to go to games. A Sunday night here would be a, a tough Monday morning for a lot of people on their way home to the, from the games and ready to start their work week the next day. There isn't a lot competing sports-wise right now for those eyeballs on the screen. So even a 5 p.m. Eastern start or something like that would probably draw some more eyeballs and allow people that travel time to get home after the games. The schedule is set up for the Eastern market. You mentioned Saskatchewan in particular, but having been in Calgary and in Edmonton on this last weekend to watch both of those games, you're right. There's not as much traffic that comes from outside the city. So a five o'clock start probably works very well. And attendance numbers, I think, reflected that. In Saskatchewan, you do have a bigger contingent that come from more than an hour away. But even with that, let's just sake of argument, it's three hours for me to get to Regina. If the game ends at eight and I get onto the bus and over to the mall where I have to pick up my vehicle, I can probably make it back at 1230. That's, that's including the three hours to drive back, obviously. That's not as bad as... A 7 o'clock game where it ends at 10, I get to the mall at 10.30 and I'm not back till almost 2 in the morning. That is becoming more and more onerous and I just don't want to be on the highway at those hours of the night either. I don't mind the 5 o'clock start. If it helps, Thursday night tends to be a later game. Friday, Saturday, Sunday tend to be the earlier game. They want consistency. They want this to be what is required viewing in a sense that you always know where it's going to be and when. And the nice thing with having the game spread over the four days as well is you continue to have each game be a feature game. You don't have any overlap. Oftentimes when you've got a a double header, the end of the first game can cut into the beginning of the second game, especially if it goes into overtime or if it's a, a close game or if there's a weather delay. Any of those kind of things can affect the viewership and the ability to watch both games in their completion. So Having a separate night for each one does eliminate that. I think it's it's great for the league. We are getting more people. I had some discussions with people last week that didn't realize that the season had started. You're, you're fighting against those people, and we're starting to see those numbers come up as people realize, hey, this is going on. It's, there isn't a lot of other stuff to watch sports-wise. As I said, there's there's golf, there's some baseball. Not a lot of other things competing at the moment, so... Unless you're up against one of those major events, there's a great opportunity to watch some fantastic football. You're, you're looking at a paradigm shift in terms of football. The USFL, the XFL have been fighting doggedly trying to create a market in the spring. And the CFL, because of the NFL draft, is kind of stuck where it is. It starts in June and it moves forward. But it's relatively speaking in Canada, it really starts to warm up in June for most of the country. 
the CFL now has to move that paradigm away from the cooler fall or fall weather and into a warmer June. The one thing that you have to consider too, afternoon games in the summer aren't the greatest idea because in the heat of the day, we're looking at as much as we hate minus 35 in November, plus 35 is not going to do you favors in the middle of the afternoon either. So they're kind of wedded to a five o'clock start in the West and a seven o'clock start in the East, just to get away from the heat of the day. That's a very fair point as well, especially we have had quite the warm spring and early summer so far. It's tough playing in that 35 degree heat. We have situations where exhaustion comes into play. A lot of players will start cramping up because of dehydration, those sorts of things. So in the name of player safety, you're right. It does make sense to push it a little bit later in the day. And before we get out of first down, uh, happy trails to Dan Carson, who was the public address announcer in Calgary. I happened to be at McMahon and just so happened, unfortunately, that was his last game. He passed away suddenly. He was a great PA announcer. Many a year I've driven to Calgary to watch the Stampeders. That was a very familiar and a very comfortable voice coming from the loudspeaker. He will be missed. Second down. We mentioned in the first part of the podcast that road teams are running the show right now. Two out of every three games played in 2023 have been won by road teams. If you want some context, and this is from the stats guru, Steve Daniel, July 13 to 16 of 2016 and October 6 to 9 of 2017 were the last two times that the road team swept a week. The longest winning streak for road teams overall, eight games, and that was also in 2017. What is happening that home cooking doesn't do it? I don't have an answer to that one. I mean, as we've discussed, there's a couple teams that have struggled mightily at home for quite some time. But game one this week was not a case of a team that generally struggles at home and haven't lost to a Western opponent at home in quite some time. This one was a, a big shocker in Winnipeg. The Bombers came out flat. The Lions came out firing on all cylinders. And it was a big 30-6 to six spanking of the Bombers. It's always a great question did one team come out flat or did the other team make them look so and in this case I'm looking at that BC line defense and how well they have played allowing roughly seven points a game which is just unheard of in the CFL so far only Calgary's put up a touchdown against them the mighty blue bomber offense that have been averaging 40 points a game with two field goals BC made a statement. I don't care who you are and what you think of June football. That was a statement game by the BC Lions. 100%. And it's their defense so far is looking similar to Winnipeg's defense of 2021, where they did not give up a lot of points or a lot of touchdowns either. The one thing I will say about Winnipeg coming out flat is the first offensive possession for the Lions. Bombers defensive backs were in great position on back-to-back plays, but did not turn to make a play on the ball, ended up taking pass interference penalties that led to the Lions opening touchdown. And then the wheels kind of started to come off after that. Both of those plays could have been picked off or easily knocked down had the defenders looked the right way. Instead, they went for big plays against. The biggest shock to me was the Lions defensive line versus that Bombers offensive line. They were beating them up the middle. They were beating them around the edges. They got to Zach Kolaris numerous times, several sacks, I think seven in total against Winnipeg, which is virtually unheard of with that offensive line over the last few seasons. So full marks to that Lions team. They came out ready to play. And I I felt this one was going to be the biggest test early on for Winnipeg, given what BC had done in their first couple of games. I did not see this outcome coming (laughs) at all. Vernon Adams completes 20 of 30 for 237 yards. Zach Kolaris, 19 of 33 for 214. BC literally was dictating terms from the second quarter on. 
And more than that, the bombers looked, they almost looked lost at times as to what to do. And I can't remember the last time, and this goes back maybe to 2015, 14, when the bomber faithful at home booed the team. I, I think they're a little bit quick on the trigger to to, uh, to boo the bombers after what they've accomplished accomplished over the last several seasons. I understand the frustration, but I have been to several games in Winnipeg that it was not unexpected to boo the team off the field. This one, to me, the biggest challenge will be how the bombers come out this week. If it was just the case of one game, it got away from them. They flush it and move on. Great. If they start to struggle against Montreal this week, then you start to evaluate player positions and and see where you go. But at this point, I, I don't think it's time to panic in Winnipeg. That game was far from their best, but I don't think they're done competing for this West title yet. I don't think we need to put the Blue Bombers out to pasture yet. Not having Jackson Jeffcoat come from the other edge does limit Willie Jefferson because now they can double team him. And he was pretty much a non-factor in this football game. The Blue Bombers, yes, Father Time is catching up to them. The thing about Father Time is that when it catches up, it happens in an instant and it's over. I just can't see how the Blue Bombers are there yet, but it does make you wonder that their pedestal has just been knocked over and there's a new kid up top. Good news in Winnipeg is Jackson Jeffcoat did participate in full practice today, so it looks like he might be returning to the lineup soon, but absolutely that was one of the, the key things is the ability to have both of those rush ends performing at a high level changes how a de- uh, changes how an opponent's offensive line has to strategize having one of them out of the lineup you key on the other guy and it really changes that dynamic bombers also making moves at the quarterback position tyrell pilgrim is now out and dakota prukop who spent some time in the usfl is now back that's a great gig if you can play spring league in the usfl and then just miss a couple games and come back and play the rest of the season in the cfl dakota prukop was lights out on short yard situations last year with winnipeg and that is why he was brought back in. Terrell Pegram had some exciting plays in preseason. Didn't look great running the short yardage in the first regular season game. So I believe that familiarity with Prukop and what he brings to the table is unfortunately for Terrell Pegram what led to his release. We'll see if he does land with another team. Uh, exciting player, fast, and could be a future quarterback in this league if given the right opportunity. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't in Winnipeg this season. Again, this philosophy of making your third string quarterback your runner for third down gambles. Again, why are you paying running backs to do the job? Set up a blocking back, get them in front of them, pick your spot and go. I, I just don't understand this. They have now fallen from the ranks of unbeaten and, as you say, are off to Montreal to take on those undefeated Montreal Alouettes, who really did a number on the Hamilton Tiger Cats. 38-12, Montreal goes in. Hamilton was favored by the point spread, and yet could not convert. They went to the score zone four times and came away with field goals every time. The Alouettes go and score touchdowns every time, and there's the difference in the game. This was another early season statement game. The Montreal Alouettes had a lot lot of question marks coming into the season. Cody Fajardo looked calm back there running that offense and turned this one into a win. I had picked Montreal to win this game. I didn't expect it to be a 26-point gap the way it it played out, but Montreal looked good on, on all facets of the game. Hamilton, as we mentioned, Bo Levi Mitchell out for six games. Matthew Schiltz thrown back into the starting quarterback position. Struggled to to convert, as you mentioned. Field goals aren't going to cut it when the other team is putting up seven each time they're coming down the field. You look at the numbers. The Alouettes have 18 first downs, Hamilton 16. Passing yards, Alouettes 292 
Hamilton 345. You kind of think that this is a much closer game than what was happening on the field, but interceptions, that same out, it seemed like, that Matthew Schiltz threw twice. One was picked off and almost scored. The second one was picked off and was gone for a score. I think the one of the high points for the Hamilton Tiger Cats is their new kicker, Mark Leggio, went four for four on his field goal attempts. Uh, a fresh start seems to have done him well in Hamilton. We'll see how that progresses for the rest of the season. Fajardo, 19 of 25, 76% passing efficiency. That's pretty darn good. Matthew Schultz, 47 attempts, 25 of them were complete, but two interceptions, as we just mentioned. Schultz will be the starter when they get back on the field. It's I don't blame him for what happened out there. On the very opening play of the game, that deep shot he threw to Tim White, he got crushed, and it looked like he was favoring his ribs for the rest of the 60. Saturday night, the Rough Riders are in Calgary to take on the Stampeders. Calgary, who has struggled at home in the last couple of years, winning three home dates last year, haven't won any this year. Unfortunately for them, that trend continues as they lose 29-26 in overtime in a game that I described as crazy to anyone that asked me. Unbelievable circumstances where fumbles were batted around. A fumble went out of bounds. It seemed like one team recovered, but the player was ineligible. It goes back to the other team. And then, of course, the final play of the game, an interception in the end zone in the second overtime mini game ends it. And the Rough Riders come out with two. I can't remember the last time a team won with two field goals, one each mini game in an overtime. One of the controversial coaching decisions in the Battle of the Dickinson Brothers was late in the game, Craig Dickinson elected to go for it on a third and short. Had they got the first down and a touchdown, it would have put them up a full two scores. They did, they did not succeed. It allowed Calgary to go back down the field, kick the tying field goal to force overtime. It's one of those situations where you look great if it's the right decision and you don't look so good if you are wrong. In my opinion, kicking the field goal to, to go up by six points would have then given Calgary the opportunity to get the ball back in good field position to march down and get that scoring, uh, scoring touchdown to essentially win the game. I, I believe it was the right call. I understand certainly why Craig Dickinson made it. And you have to have faith in your offense in those situations that they're going to pick up the first down. Again, that quarterback sneak. <laughs> we saw it happen in Edmonton. We saw it in, I don't trust a quarterback sneak on third down. I just don't. Shea Patterson was tripped up in the backfield. Great effort by that D line and linebacker core from the Stampeders to stop him. It took a review to make sure that he hadn't made it. I agree with you. The, the, it was the right call. You're, you're, you're taking the game by the throat. If you make that play, you've won. Other question that came out of that game was earlier in the quarter, Saskatchewan scores a touchdown and decide to go for two. Now, at the moment, they're up 10. But for whatever reason, they decide that 12 was better than an 11-point lead. They don't make the two-point convert, and that comes back to bite them. That one was the questionable call. Like I said, I agree with... Craig Dickinson on going for it on third down late in the game. This one didn't make as much sense to me, and I don't know if they've lost a little bit of confidence if Brett Lothar was struggling with his with his kicking that night. It seems like a weird one to me. You're already up by 10. Does that one or two point difference change the outcome too much? It, it really doesn't. An odd call. Well, 11 makes it a touchdown two-point conversion and a field goal to tie. 10 is a, just a regular touchdown and the field goal. If you get to 12, then you force him into two touchdowns. That's what the hope is. But at that moment in the game, you're not really too concerned about that unless you don't believe your defense can't stop the Stampeders anymore. And they seem to be hanging tough with the team. It's it, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of that decision at that moment. Bigger question, of course, was Jake Mayer at the end of the game. He takes a really hard hit, lands on his shoulder at the end of regulation. He pulls himself out of the game. 
Tommy Stevens has to go in and finish up. In overtime, Stevens just carrying the ball is ripping the Rough Rider defense. And yet they put Jake Mayer in and he he didn't look right and he bounced a pass to his receiver. The only other time he throws the ball is the interception into the end zone. A, a tough way to lose for Jake Mayer. He says he doesn't regret the decision. He regrets the outcome. Throwing it into double coverage in overtime, it was a bit of a wing and a prayer. A, a second field goal ties that game back up. I understand wanting to go for the win, but you do have to be smart about it. It's a, a great testament to a defense when they can end the game by get, regaining possession of the ball. It was a, a great effort by the Rough Riders. We've seen it in overtime in the past as well. An offense walking out off the field without a chance to score is a disheartening way to lose the game. Mayer was 19 of 36 for 291. On the other side, Trevor Harris, 20 of 30 for 275. The win puts the Rough Riders ahead of the Stampeders. It's only the second time that Craig has beat his brother David in the regular season. For the Stampeders, yes, they are struggling right now, but they did last year and the year before at the beginning of the season, and they seem to find their mojo and wind up as a contender at the end of the year. There's no Bo Levi Mitchell there to guide them out of this. This is Jake Mayer's team, and if he is going to be the man at quarterback in Calgary, he's going to have to step up the way he did last year after taking over from Mitchell. If he doesn't do it, what do the Stampeders do? They don't have a lot of other options at quarterback, that's for sure. It was an okay game by Jake Mayer, but not a, a great game. Again, as I've mentioned in the last couple of weeks, he hasn't solidified in my mind that he is the future for the Calgary Stampeders. They've certainly put a lot of faith in him this year, and this is the opportunity for him to prove it. But you can't lose too much ground in this Western Division because there are some other really good teams. I expect Winnipeg and BC to continue to win the majority of their games. And now you've got the Rough Riders ahead of the Stampeders this early in the season as well. The final game of the four set was Toronto in Edmonton. The Elks started strong. It was a one point difference at halftime. And then that third quarter came along and the wheels came off for Edmonton. Toronto absolutely dominating and pulling away. 43-31, the score flatters the Elks. It does. Uh, Chad Kelly it continues to look calm and relaxed, leading the Toronto Argonauts offense. Again, not flashy numbers, 13 for 23, 264 yards and a touchdown. He did throw a couple of picks, but he did enough to win this one. I don't know what the Elks are going to need to do to pull out a win at home. They were, as you mentioned, they were in this game early to the halfway point, and then things just seemed to fall apart on them. We saw very uncharacteristic things happen to the Elks. For instance, Geno Lewis with the team trying to get back in the game, being stripped of the ball at the Toronto goal line. I've never seen that happen to him. It just seemed like to me that once Toronto got their running game going the way they wanted it to work, Edmonton had no answers. A.J. Olette, he had holes that I could have run through. He did. He had a great game and it looks like a reasonably healthy Andrew Harris contributing as well. They've got a great one-two punch. It seems like Ouellette has taken on the role as the number one guy with Andrew Harris as the backup, but he also still had six carries for 32 yards. So a decent yards per carry night for Andrew Harris. 194 yards rushing for the Argos overall, which is in a, in a season where the yards per carry has gone down to levels Back to 1986, the performance by Ouellette and that Toronto offensive line was impressive. A great highlight of the night as well was happening on the sidelines with Pinball Clemens and Gizmo Williams reuniting for a handshake and a hug. Two of the all-time great kick returners, two of the most exciting players in the history of the CFL. It brought me back to my childhood days of watching those two run up and down the field on kick returns and, and offensive plays. It was a really fun moment to see those two reunite. 
Jarrett Dagey comes in to finish the game for the Elks after Taylor Cornelius is pulled. Cornelius had a decent day in terms of accuracy, 14 of 18, but only 135 yards. Dagey came in 9 of 11 for 163. He did throw a pick six, but he did throw two touchdown passes. Granted, one of them in garbage time off a deflected ball. It looks like Jarrett Dagey will get the start for the Elks in their next game. As we mentioned earlier, Kai Loxley has been released, so it looks like Trey Ford will be dressed for the next game at least. I don't believe that Chris Jones is sold on a quarterback yet. He had a lot of confidence in Taylor Cornelius last year and at the start of this season, but that appears to have waned a bit, and we'll see what the future holds. I don't know if there's anybody out there as far as trade value that you can pick up that's going to turn things around. The Elks need to solve that situation. They have too many weapons on offense that they shouldn't be struggling to put up these points. Eugene Lewis is one of the top three receivers in the league for sure. I would even put a strong argument at the number one receiver in the league. So for your team to continue to struggle with that guy on offense, you have to make some changes. Famously, Dylan Mitchell claimed that he could get 2,000 yards. Well, he's added six more to his total as a result of the game against Toronto. You mentioned Eugene Lewis, five receptions for 43 yards. Thinking back to Jones' tour in Saskatchewan, remember he struggled with Kevin Glenn and Brandon Bridge as to which one was going to be his starting quarterback, and that continued throughout the season. He's a defensive guru. He had Michael Riley the first tour in Edmonton and Michael Riley took care of a lot of things for him he doesn't have a Michael Riley right now he doesn't have a Willie Jefferson on defense and those are two pieces of the puzzle that he has not found again third down just three games for the CFL this coming weekend a Friday Saturday Monday affair We start in Ottawa with the Red Blacks, with Tyree Adams getting the start. We'll face the Edmonton Elks. Edmonton went into Ottawa and beat them last year. I don't know. You've got an 0-2 and an 0-3 going head-to-head here. I just don't know. Two-and-a-half point favorites are the Red Blacks. How do you come up with that number? Well, you've also got Jarrett Dagey making the start for the Edmonton Elks, so you've got two unproven quarterbacks in this league in in Adams and Daggy. We have seen both of these teams struggle at home. Does that give the advantage to the Elks being that they're on the road in this one? They, I, I don't even know where to start on this one either. I guess I'm going to pick the Red Blacks at home to end their losing streak. I say with so much confidence, but that's that's where I'm going to go in this one. I'll take Ottawa at home on a last second field goal by Lewis Ward to win by one point. So Ottawa to win. Other than a coin flip, I have no idea. The problem is with Deggy and with Adams, one of them could just go lights out or they both could. And this could be the game of the year. Or or neither could, and they struggle to put points on the board. But it's such, that's the thing. It's such an unknown. You have so little upon which to base an opinion. Other than Ottawa has struggled coming out of the gate. Edmonton has struggled coming out of the gate. Defensive-wise, they're pretty much a saw-off. I think I would give the edge to the Elks. Offensive-wise, ugh. And, and Devontae Dedman now is gone for the season. It just, it adds up, like, compounding, compounding, compounding for the Red Blacks. Like, when does the injury bug and when does the, it just stop and let these guys that they want to play, play. I, I'm going to lean towards the Elks. Play better on the road, at least in terms of wins and losses. They did last year. All their wins came on the road last year. They did well against the East last year. <laughs> this one's... This one's really, really tough. You sound as conf- you sound as confident as I am. 
<laughs> I bet you there's a lot of the betting public that's exactly the same. It's what do you do and with what confidence do you apply it? One bright spot for the Elks from last week's game was CJ Sims on the return game. The Elks haven't had a, a kick return touchdown in quite some time. I believe it's coming soon. CJ Sims looked electric for the Elks in what he did in, in limited action last game with three returns for 104 yards. It won't be long before he breaks one. It might be in this game against the Red Blacks. Andrew's famous saying about the Elks return game was catch and fall down. That's true. CJ Sims really put on a show against the Argonauts. Saturday night, the Blue Bombers are in Montreal to take on the Alouettes. Winnipeg won there last year with a big fourth quarter and a huge Janarian Grant kick return score. The Alouettes are undefeated. The Bombers are 2-1. and one. The Bombers are smarting. But the question is, did we see the real Blue Bombers against the BC Lions or was that Blue Bomber team that played the Rough Riders the week before, was that the team that is going to go to Montreal? Mike O'Shea is patient. He will not panic about anything. He is going to work slowly to figure out what went wrong against the Lions. I've always argued that the defense in Winnipeg, if you want to beat them, you throw deep. You pick on those corners. The Alouettes can do that. Fajardo, if there's one thing that he's great at, it's deep throws. He is almost lethal with his deep throws. With the with the bombers, I mean, most of the betting lines are at six. We always go with halves. Five point five. We'll say the bombers are are favored in Montreal. I don't know. It's again. That's a that's a big line against a team. Montreal's defense is good. They're going to give fits to Calaris and the, that te- that receiving core. Does Oliveira make some noise and get some rushing in? What does Stanback do coming back the other way? How much does he help Fajardo? This could be a closer game than anyone thinks. The Alouettes, I, I trust her for real. The 2-0 and o may be just a harbinger of where they're going. I'm taking Winnipeg minus the points in this one. I believe the Bombers do win, but it's going to be a close game, closer than a touchdown. I'm, I'm hoping as a Bomber fan that last week was the anomaly. We always talk about how anything can happen in this league. And case in point, last year, if you look at the stats, Dane Evans had his best game of the season against the Bombers last year. He looked like the Dane Evans of old. The Bombers came back after that and went on a tear all the way to the Grey Cup. I believe they've still got that in them. This is going to be a a tough test as a comeback game after that lackluster performance against the Lions. I think the Winnipeg Blue Bombers win this one on the road, but it's it's a closer than five and a half point spread. Montreal to win, it's going to be early turnovers that are converted. That's where they beat the Blue Bombers. Monday, it's a national holiday in Canada. Typically it's July the 1st, but because it falls on a Saturday, most places are observing Monday the 3rd of July as the holiday, so the Argonauts are playing at home and they're taking on the BC Lions. This is a battle of undefeateds on a holiday Monday. This is something that is going to be a lot of eyeballs looking at because, wow, you've got that defense in BC that is just remarkable so far. And you've got that storyline with Chad Kelly and AJ Ouellette and that Toronto receiving core. It's like the two opposable forces meeting head to head. Who's going to come out on top? The Lions right now are favored by two and a half. Again, you might as well put this one to zero and just say, pick the winner. Only three games this week and arguments can be made for any team winning these ones. It's a a tough week to pick. I like what I saw from that Lions defense. I haven't seen huge numbers put up by Chad Kelly yet. He has done enough to win the games, but he hasn't blown anybody out of the water I'm giving the edge to the Lions on the road in this one. They're going to win this one. They're going to cover that spread. Toronto has great defense as well. So this one is is going to be a really good game. But I I tend to lean towards the Lions. Vernon Adams has looked really solid 
at quarterback for the Lions this year as well. So I'm going to give them the edge. What a start to the season for the BC Lions. They play the West semifinalist opponent, and then they go on and play the West final or the Grey Cup opponent and the other Grey Cup participant. Like that's <laughs> You can't schedule it any rougher, and the Lions are favored in the third game of the set. This is just unbelievable. Is anyone thinking about Nathan Rourke right now with that offense? Vernon Adams Jr. is doing what he needs to do. They, they've they been missing receivers. Lucky Whitehead goes out. Dominique Rhyme goes out. Of course, they're still missing Keon Hatcher, who hasn't played yet. Yet they still find a way. It It's just fascinating to see this team. They've already pitched a shutout this year as well, so... Everything seems to be working for that Lions defense. It'll be great to watch them develop throughout the season and see where that points against lands because so far averaging less than seven points a game against is a phenomenal start that I don't think anybody fully expected. If they can keep this up, even remotely holding that pace, it's going to be a historic defense. <sighs> I'm going to lean towards the Argonauts at home. Toronto is a tough out at the best of times at BMO. They proved that last year. They've been proving it. And they, and this team, to me, the way they owned the Elks in that third quarter, where they just dictated terms, not unlike what BC did in the second quarter against Winnipeg. The Argonauts are a team in ascension. The Lions are a team in ascension. This is a, am I getting there faster than you? I'm, I'm going to go with the Argonauts. Thank you for listening to our show. Third Down Gamble is hosted on Podbean and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter at Third Down Gamble. Join us again the Third Down Gamble podcast audio worth watching. Third Down Gamble uses the expert resources provided by Canadian Football League player and game statistics for analytics, game notes, and statistics, and 3downnation.com for news, insight, and in-depth analysis. Please visit cfl.ca and 3downnation.com for the most up-to-date information on the Canadian Football League.